Hi, this is Tom Barton of the University of Chicago and Internet 2, and I'm the manager of the Grouper Project. This is the first of a three-part series, video series introducing you to Grouper. Part one is about the general notions of access management and Grouper, the Grouper Project. So let's start out by asking, you know, why have an access management strategy? What's that about? And so really what the problems are that you're trying to solve by implementing access management tools and having an access management strategy are several. First, you want to try to lower cost and time to deliver new services. Uh, that's, that's enabled in part because if you have more information available to manage access to the new service uh, in a common platform, uh, it's going to be a lot easier for you to go ahead and implement the desired access policy compared to having to dig that information out of your systems and out of people's minds and uh, put them into uh, service-specific uh, repositories and management systems. You don't have to build those if you already have a common one. Uh, secondly, uh, you can simplify things for users and for people that manage their access and make things more consistent across services by using the same group or the same rule in many places where that may make sense. So, for example, pictured here, you can imagine uh, uh, the uh, uh, students and instructors in a given uh, course group uh, all being provided access to email, a wiki site, and uh, a lab reservation system. Uh, and you don't have to enter three lists. You have one used in three places. Um, additional benefits have to do with um, really uh, not necessarily unique to higher ed, but letting the right people manage access. There's a combination of systems, business systems like student systems and HR systems and the like that provide some information, but other people closer to the purpose and the service of the access uh, have, have uh, information about who else needs to have access or might not have, need to have access to those services. You want to let them make the decisions about what's necessary for their purpose and take central IT out of the loop. You don't want to force them to make phone calls or write emails to people in the back, uh, back rooms to make changes to systems. They should be able to make those changes to the access policies themselves. And finally, you can see who can access what uh, with a report uh, rather than a fire drill. And I can tell you that at this point we have more than 50 applications integrated with Grouper at the University of Chicago. And this is truly a value that you can really only appreciate once you've gotten a sufficiently mature access management strategy in place. Uh, this is really a great one. Um, well, so what does access management do? Well, basically it's the process, I think of it as the way that you make authorization much more than mere authentication. So you can think about sort of a stage zero and uh, some kind of maturity uh, process for uh, IT operations. And at stage zero, all you can do is uh, uh, you know, hand out credentials and someone it's either active or inactive. And based upon that, if someone can log into a service, they're allowed to get into the service. Many of us start out there. Um, and so access management is to get away from there. You need to be able to log in, but maybe you want to restrict access to some people, but not all people that can log in. And the most common way that uh, the first step that, that uh, organizations take to make authorization something more than just authentication is to use a single user attribute, usually their affiliation, the person's affiliation. Reflect that in an LDAP or an Active Directory where services can get at the attribute about a person. Uh, so that lets the service implement simple access policies. Uh, depicted here, for example, we see a faculty person logging in uh, to a staff portal. The staff portal, uh, and when they, when they uh, process their authentication, gets the attribute, their affiliation attribute, out of LDAP or Active Directory. And because, uh, as indicated in green here, the staff portal is configured to let folks with the faculty affiliation in, it'll do so. I suppose if that person were a student in this case, they wouldn't get in because they don't have a qualifying affiliation. Um, the second stage in making authorization much more than authentication and having an access management um, strategy is to really enrich that picture by getting information, groups of people, uh, from systems of record, like who all is in a given course, uh, what are all the uh, different financial accounts and where are people paid for uh, from, uh, uh, what accounts are people paid from, grouped by that way, what are the department hierarchies, um, that kind of thing. When you have that much more information in the access management system, you can begin to define within the access management system some of the access management policies for each service. And so begin to pull that service-specific access policy definition out from the service and into a common centralized access management system. 
So the, the shows, for example, that you might have the math faculty group as learned from one of the core business systems and have a policy that says they can access math faculty resources. In the third uh, phase of getting authorization to be more than authentication is really focused on taking that centralized access management uh, infrastructure, the, the database, the management interfaces, the integration components, and allow others, in addition to central IT, to use them. So you get more distributed, you, you begin to distribute out management away from the central IT to departmental IT or others. You begin to be able to manage exceptions, that is sources of information that come from outside of core business systems. They might come from individuals or from ancillary uh, systems that people maintain on the sign. Uh, and you also let departments that have their own IT services manage access on your common uh, access management infrastructure so they don't have to build their own. But you want to delegate to them so they can do their own thing without having to build their own. And here's an example where, extending that math faculty group of a moment ago, there may be a support group in the math department that might not be known to a core business system, but is known to the math department folks, so they can make a math support group and maintain it and modify the policy in the access management system so that both the math faculty and math support people are able to access math faculty resources without involving central IT in that decision. Finally, um, uh, the, it really is to get a lot deeper, uh, much more capable. Uh, so adding not just groups, but putting richer uh, structures out there for access management like roles and permissions. Um, also allowing more direct integration by applications uh, with the access management system, generally over uh, web services or an enterprise service bus. Uh, and uh, so the roles and privileges are being used to model more fine-grained kinds of uh, authorization privileges, sometimes that are more uh, the sort of things that are more that are more common in more deep vertical applications. So here's an example where Joe has an HR admin role uh, in, for the math department. So long as John, uh, or pardon me, Joe, I guess John uh, works there. So that would be the uh, more sophisticated uh, access policy to embody in the centralized access management system. Well, that's the general picture. Grouper has been developed uh, in parallel with the, our, our refining of that picture. Um, it's an open source, uh, community-driven project uh, uh, guided by the Internet2 Middleware Initiative. It's been around for a little while now. Uh, the first release of Grouper software was V0.5 in December 2004. Um, the main reasons for developing our own access management system, that is one that's geared for its universities and research organizations, I mean, is that the kinds of uh, tools that were available at the time and I think continue to be the case uh, today in 2012, is that uh, the tools, uh, the, off the other off-the-shelf tools really aren't capable of achieving the highly distributed footprint for access management that is needed uh, in common at universities and research organizations. So having support for the act of delegation as a means of achieving that uh, widely distributed management footprint is a key aim and I, I think successfully met by Grouper. Likewise, uh, we wanted to be sure that we wouldn't cause disruption. We, we wanted to minimize the obstacles to adopting good access management practices and strategies by being able to integrate with just about anything else that was already going on and so enhancing and extending what was already happening for identity and access management at a given organization. And I'll talk a lot about that more in the third of these introductory videos. Uh, in Grouper 2.x, which was uh, 2.0 was released in September of 2011, uh, we completed a program of expanding Grouper's capabilities beyond really good management of groups to include roles and permissions. I'll talk more about that in the second introductory video um, in, in the series. Uh, we also added rules uh, to, for more sophisticated access management. Well, that's the end of the first uh, video. Uh, the second one will be coming up uh, soon uh, uh, called uh, Grouper's uh, Core Access Management Capabilities, where I'll go into more of those uh, uh, beyond just groups uh, and the delegation capabilities that Grouper embodies. Thank you.